We're joined um, now uh, on, on the floor by uh, Michael Madsen. Michael's um, uh, uh, a filmmaker who is um, uh, will be joining will be joining the division um, on on our tour through Chernobyl and Baikonur. Um, uh, we first encountered uh, Michael's work um, with the extraordinary documentary Into Eternity. Um, uh, hopefully, we'll do uh, some screenings out on the trip for for, um, for those of you who are coming with us. If not, um, uh, please uh, check it out. Into Eternity tells the story of the Onkalo Nuclear Waste Repository in Finland, um, a facility that, uh, as well as Peter has mentioned, that, that is required to stay intact for 100,000 years. Um, and really what the film kind of looks at is that no structure in human history has ever stood for that kind of period of time. It's, it's sort of a time scale as a culture we don't really have any kind of way of thinking about or dealing with. Um, so the film addresses an audience in the remote future and questions on Carlo's eternal existence and its legacy as a reminder of his toxic energy source. Um, so we're thrilled to have uh, Michael um, on board, both for the division and for, uh, and for the to present here this morning. Thanks so much for coming along uh, for the COVID-19. Uh, thanks, Michael. Well, um, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I'm very much looking forward to the trip. And of course, now I have the uh, opportunity to talk about a film which you probably haven't seen, so that of course gives me some liberties. But as we have said, uh, hopefully we will have a screening. Hopefully, we can have a screening later on the trip, and that will, of course, uh, reveal more about what the film is about than I'm able to, to say right now. But um, um, uh, first of all, um, the Onkolo facility, as Liam said, is the first attempt in the world to create a permanent solution for nuclear waste. That means a kind of a bunker which has to last for 100,000 years. Um, one critic mentioned about the film that Onkolo is possibly the first post-human structure. And uh, this is what I will talk a little bit about because this is also what got me interested in filming that facility. Because um, basically I thought that if you are building something that has to last for 100,000 years, there will have to be some engineers who knows about what 100,000 years is and that is something that, that I personally can relate to. As we heard about earlier, uh, I also heard about studies that the maximum is five generations that a person can relate to into the future. But in this case, um, to build something that's foolproof, um, you need to have an idea about what 100,000 years means. And uh, that would mean uh, different scenarios. So when I first went to the construction site in Finland where they had begun the digging and now have reached the final depth of 4-500 meters, um, what was the single most interesting um, research uh, information was that um, long-term safety advice have told me that concerning informing the future about this facility, because we do have the problem that radioactivity is something we cannot sense in any way. Concerning that question, I actually believe it's better to uh, hide it. And Onkalo does mean hiding place in Finnish. And I said, why is that an idea? Because you would imagine that if there would be some kind of manual for this place for people 50,000 years from now, for example, and if repairs are needed, it would be much, much easier to perform those repairs. But then he said, well, the thing is, how do we actually communicate over such a time span? And um, basically, what he perceives as the real threat to this facility is human curiosity. Because if we look at human history, what we see is that everything that we have found, materials, etc., has been opened. Uh, I would also say that most likely human curiosity is also what led us to this natural scientific understanding of our surrounding of reality, which led us to nuclear power in the first place. Um, 
But my point is here that if we look at the construction design of the Yonkou facility, there is one thing that sort of overrules everything else, and that is that this facility has to be able to operate by itself in a kind of silent mode. Um, there are various arguments for that. The first one that this private company puts forth is that we should not impose any undue burdens on future generations. And this is, of course, the whole idea about trying to act responsibly and ethically correct, etc. This is a polluter pace principle. We are using the energy of nuclear, nuclear energy, and we should also clean up after ourselves. So we build something that is. Uh, it doesn't need any maintenance, doesn't need any power supplies, it doesn't need all the things which is the case today. Namely that nuclear waste needs to be highly nuclear waste, uh, needs to be cooled for 40 years in pools. If a situation like what happened in Japan comes, also the pools will self-ignite, which has happened there, etc. For 40 years it has to cool down. And that needs surveillance, that needs a power supply cooling. Uh, so if we can build something that doesn't need all that, the future will not need to even to know about it. But there is another and more important reason behind this construction design, and that comes back to this element of possibly the first approach of construction. And that is that uh, the scientist in Finland does not expect society as we know today to exist continuously in such a time span. And I think that if we look at the history of mankind, I think that the only constant is that things, they change. We know that the Roman Empire has been there, but also that it went away. And when we talk about the Middle Ages as, as the Dark Ages, there is a truth in it as far as, insofar as uh, many different sort of institutions did not exist to the same extent as it did during the Roman Empire, for example. So civilizations, they tend to come and go. So if you build something that has to last for 100,000 years, it may be wise to hide it and to make sure that it operates even without anybody knows about it. And of course, when it comes to nuclear energy and the knowledge about what radiation is um, when the uranium mines are depleted and that may be within a hundred years depending on the rise of this energy form I mean how much is used of it um, it is very difficult to imagine that the know-how about nuclear the technology will be maintained because it will be obsolete uh, but still you have this waste and I think that um, if we look at uh, uh, the history of radiation, starting from this first X-ray of Madame Curie's hand, which has this eerie, well, it's a skeleton that you see, of course, because that's, that's what it does, this, this form of light that radiation is. If we look at that history, which is perhaps in the 1880s or something and onward, um, I think the only true thing that you can extract from that history is that at any given point in this history we have always thought that we knew everything about this energy form uh, and all the times we discovered that there was a little something else a little other um, and this may be the reason but this may still be the case. I think it would be much more wiser to expect that. And um, one of the problems that uh, is shown uh, in this 100,000 year perspective uh, is, of course, that on the one hand we have. Uh, nuclear waste as a result of, uh, of this high developed technology, this deep insight into nature, but it also has this kind of byproduct in terms of the waste. And if it is in fact impossible for us to comprehend 
what 100,000 years actually means, what that could encompass in the future, uh, then it is uh, impossible to really to act responsibly. Uh, so that's a very interesting kind of uh, limitation that I think is shown when building such a facility in, uh, in Finland and when going to such extremes as to uh, building, uh, being conscious about that this facility, uh, if it works, uh, may be the last uh, remaining artifact of our civilization. I hope that we can talk more about the film when, when you perhaps see it, because uh, this is a, this is a so-called creative documentary. That means that it's a personal film. It's, it's it's my way of understanding what this facility means and and uh, what I think is interesting about this facility is that it it. Uh, There's nothing like it, so it gave me the opportunity to create a kind of uh, an outside of time and space perspective of on our own time. And this is why the film plays around with the idea of, of addressing the future uh, and is very interested in the different speculations in terms of how is it would it in fact be possible to to communicate and toward the future. Um, I'll try to make it very brief because I think we're all very, very tired uh, from, from uh, all this talking so far. Um, but uh, I would just then make a last short comment about what I understand to be the idea about this, uh, this trip into to unknown fields. Um, there is this idea, I believe, that by visiting uh, architecture as a kind of physical um, expressions of of, um, of, of 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 our dreams, etc., etc., then there will be some kind of feedback, and um, I think that. Uh, if we on this trip can enter also sort of unknown fields in terms of thinking or experiencing things, it would be very, very interesting. And if uh, one sh could be able to make any kind of comparison with nuclear waste uh, to something that we know something about, something that perhaps has the same time scale. Uh, because we have buildings that we compare with, and and um, then we could talk about fire, um, uh, real fire, so to say. In the film, I talk about nuclear waste as a kind of new fire, which has the the special uh, signifier that it's impossible to extinguish, which is the problem that they're having in Japan right now. You can say that it's possible for us to ignite this new fire, that's what we do in these reactors, but we cannot put it out. And one German semiologist had, has made the following comparison that I'll try to make very brief, and that is that um, fire in the old form was something that mankind first, that we first encounter in terms of thunderstorms and, and lightning struck and something was on fire and it was a natural phenomenon that we had no control over. Uh, later on, uh, we managed to uh, to preserve the fire by, he thinks, most likely by actually uh, changing the whole structure of society. I think he actually thinks that it was, this was the, the arrival of the first housewife in terms that somebody was left behind to take to maintain the fire while others went out hunting. Um, later on, and this is actually in the Middle Ages, it's only then, after of course we could also ignite fire, etc., but only in the Middle Ages we can talk about that it was possible to extinguish fire because in the Middle Ages the first insurance companies arrived 
comes into being. Uh, and that would be a way of sort of to say to, to control fire that you would have this collective insurance uh, But his point is that um, we are now in terms of nuclear waste or nuclear energy, this this uh, form of technology, in a situation in which we can only ignite the fire but not put it out. And if we should imagine to be able to control this fire, uh, we would also have to imagine a whole new kind of structure in society. And what he could be thinking about is, of course, a little bit what also is actually in the Finnish legislation right now, because for some reason the Finnish government has taken upon itself the responsibility to transfer information about this facility in Finland to the future for 100,000 years. And the idea is that they will have a kind of an archive that is manned, because a manned archive will get around uh, problems such as uh, how to store information, obsolete technologies, the change <coughs> in language which appears over time, etc. So, um, if you have a land archive, theoretically, uh, you would always know what you're dealing with, uh, as long as the librarians also are the scientists, etc., etc. Uh, of course, this uh, solution has this other problem which has been called the nuclear priesthood and that is that over time these uh, protectors that knows how to deal with these dangerous substances they can get the idea of that yes certainly we will protect you dear society around us but once a year send us your virgin. So it's a little office that normally keeps track of um, satellites and things like that. But they have agreed to uh, form a kind of a drill for what I would call the ultimate Copernican revolution. That would be a encounter with a, an, an alien intelligent life form. Um, so they will help me in trying to map that out. And that is, of course, again, a question about what would that actually mean to our own uh, self-understanding, which is also what I attempt to investigate in the terms. I think that's all that I would uh, uh, say right now, but, but if we see the film, we can of course talk, talk much more about it. Thank you very much. Oh, I forgot to show the trailer. <laughs> well, I'll just show that, just to get a little impression. I think it comes now. Heading towards a place where you should never go. What is there is dangerous and impossible. You should not have come here. We call it Onko. Onko means hiding. Uncle must last 100,000 years. Nothing built by man has lasted even a tenth of that time span. It is still unfinished, though work began in the 20th century when I was just a child. Work will be completed in the 22nd century, long after my death.